So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. I'd like to start with a poem by Mary Oliver titled, Why I Wake Early. Hello, sun in my face. Hello, you who make the morning and spread it over the fields and into the faces of the tulips and the nodding morning glories and into the windows of even the miserable and the crotchety. Best preacher that ever was, dear star that just happens to be where you are in the universe, to keep us from ever darkness, to ease us with warm touching, to hold us in the great hands of light. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Watch now how I start the day in happiness, in kindness. Henry Nouwen says in his book, Spiritual Direction, a Buddhist monk once came to visit me and told me the following story. Many years ago, there was a young man who searched for truth, happiness, joy, and the right way of living. After many years of traveling, many diverse experiences, and many hardships, he realized he had not found any answers for his questions and that he needed a teacher. One day, he heard about a famous Zen master. Immediately, he went to him, threw himself at his feet, and said, Please, master, be my teacher. The master listened to him, accepted his request, and made him his personal secretary. Wherever the master went, his new secretary went with him. But although the master spoke to many people who came to him for advice, he never spoke to his secretary. After three years, the young man was so disappointed and frustrated that he no longer could restrain himself. One day he burst out in anger, saying to his master, I have sacrificed everything, given away all I had, and followed you. Why haven't you taught me? The master looked at him with great compassion and said, Don't you understand that I've been teaching you during every moment you have been with me? When you bring me a cup of tea, don't I drink it? When you bow to me, don't I bow to you? When you clean my desks, don't I say thank you very much? The young man could not grasp what his master was saying and became very confused. Then suddenly the master shouted at the top of his voice, When you see, you see it direct. At that moment, the young man received enlightenment. The distance between a Zen master in the Far East teaching an eager young student and a Christian spiritual director in the, re in the West responding to a spiritual seeker might seem like a wide, wide bridge to cross. Still, this story powerfully points to the wisdom we need to live the questions of our lives, both alone and in community, as we seek our mission in the world. The young man in the Zen story has unspoken but urgent questions. What is truth? How may I find joy and happiness? What is the right way to living? To his, we might add our own life questions. What am I to do with my life? Whom shall I marry? Where shall I live? 
What gifts do I have to share? What do I do with my loneliness? Why am I so needy for affection, approval, or power? How can I overcome my fears, my shame, my addictions, and my sense of inadequacy or failure? Once, quite a few years ago, I had the opportunity of meeting Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I was struggling with many things at the time and decided to use the occasion to ask Mother Teresa's advice. As soon as we sat down, I started explaining all my problems and difficulties, trying to convince her of how complicated it all was. When after 10 minutes of elaborate explanation, I finally became quiet. Mother Teresa looked at me and quietly said, Well, when you spend one hour a day adoring your Lord and never do anything which you know is wrong, you will be fine. When she said this, I realized suddenly that she had punctured my big balloon of complex self-complaints and pointed me far beyond myself to the place of real healing. Reflecting on this brief but decisive encounter, I realized I had raised a question from below and that she had given an answer from above. At first, her answer didn't seem to fit my question, but then I began to see that her answer came from God's place and not from the place of my complaints. Most of the time, we respond to questions from below with answers from below. The result is often more confusion. Mother Teresa's answer was like a flash of lightning in my darkness. Seeking spiritual direction for me means to ask the big questions, the fundamental questions, the universal ones, in the context of a supportive community. Out of asking the right questions and living the questions, will come right answers, actions that present themselves in compelling ways. To live the questions and act rightly, guided by God's Spirit, requires both discipline and courage. Discipline to ask, seek, knock, until the door opens. Matthew 7, 7, 8. Kim Rosin, in her book Saved by a Poem, writes about the medicine of poetry. Mary Oliver says, Poetry is a life-cherishing force. For poems are not words after all, but fires for the cold, ropes let down to the lost, something as necessary as bread in the pockets of the hungry. Yes, indeed. As I learned more poems, I was astounded at the power of their medicine. It seemed that just about every aspect of my life was being infused by the gathering wellspring of poetry inside me. Like a convert to some new religion, I was giddy with enthusiasm. I wanted to share it with everyone I met. My excitement was enough to propel me through the wall of shyness that had surrounded me since I was a child and launched me into surprisingly deep conversations with all sorts of people. I spoke poems to anyone who would listen, friends, clients, students, even the stranger sitting next to me on the plane if she or he happened to ask about my life. It was as if I had come upon an elixir that would instantly open the heart, and I wanted to tell everyone. Naively, I imagined this discovery to be my own, but as I shared the poems with others and talked about my experience, a remarkable phenomenon occurred. All sorts of people started telling me about poems that had saved their lives. More than a few pulled index cards ragged with age from their wallets to show me the lines that they had seen them through the hard times. Several reached back decades in memory to speak a poem learned in high school, which even today they whisper to themselves when in need. My own father, who had never revealed any interest in poetry, launched into John Milton's famous sonnet on his blindness upon learning of my passion. 
He had memorized the poem in high school in 1933, and it lived within him for 75 years. Almost everyone I spoke to knew a person who had found a path through some dark jungle by light of a poem. It turned out that poetry, carried on scraps of paper or taped to the fridge or committed to memory, was a resource that had a long history, a lineage of great teachers, and an entire heritage that had, that born as I was in the middle of the 20th century in America, I had completely missed out on. One of the most resonant voices for the potency and necessity of spoken poetry is Dr. Maya Angelou. We met in September 2005 at a conference called Women in Power. I was to deliver, to deliver a closing poem after an evening of extraordinary keynote speakers. Dr. Angelou's speech was the last just before my poem. Her voice rang out from the stage as I sat in the front row, not wanting to miss a word, waiting for the last possible moment to slip backstage and prepare myself to go on. She spoke about the vital need for our voices to arise and be heard, the courage to set them free, and the necessity of support and community as each woman dares to speak. Every time she walks onto a stage, she told us, she imagines her grandmother out in the audience. Sometimes she adds her mother and other women in her life who have loved and supported her. Without them, she said, she would not stand on that stage alone. As she spoke, she punctuated her words and memories with poems that she recited by heart, her voice rich and swaying, a wide river of sound. Then she spoke of her childhood, how she had found her own voice at the age of 12 after years of being mute. I'm sure many in the audience had read her autobiography, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, and remembered that she'd been raped by her mother's lover when she was eight. After she w he was murdered, she went mute because she imagined her own words had caused his death. Just my breath, carrying my words out, might poison people and they'd curl up and die like the black, fat slugs that only pretended. She explains in her autobiography, so the young Maya stopped talking for almost six years. When I was about 12, I read and reread I Know Why the Cageberg Sings. The story of those years of mutism fascinated me. An extremely quiet child myself, I wished I had known the young Marguerite as she was then called. I was sure we would have been best friends. Perhaps she would have been a companion in the loneliness of my alienation from most conversations. At family gatherings and school dances, my silence bordered on antisocial, and I was reprimanded for not being more outgoing. I wondered what it would be like to give up talking completely without apology. I was haunted by questions about Marguerite's silence. What did she do with all that space while the rest of the world filled even the slightest pause with small talk? Did she ever speak even to herself? And what brought her voice out at last? What was important enough to make her break her vow? In three and a half decades, I hadn't forgotten these questions. As Dr. Maya Angelou's rich, buttered voice poured into the audience, they floated through my mind. What did I do in the silence? She plucked the question right out of my thoughts, as if we had indeed been best friends when I was 12. Poetry. I memorized poetry. I, remem I memorized 60 Shakespearean sonnets, and some of the things I memorized, I'd never heard them spoken. So I memorized them according to the cadence that I had heard in my head. I loved Edgar Allan Poe, and I memorized everything I could find. And I loved Paul Lawrence Dunbar, still do. It was like putting a CD on. If I wanted to, I'd just run through my memory and think, that's one I'd like to hear. As she walked the dirt roads of Stamps, Arkansas, speaking to no one, the poems would play through her mind like invisible friends.